Great. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Scott and Chi. Uh, so I'm very pleased to be presenting this uh, webinar today. Um, and what I'm going to talk about are um, uh, small to moderate explosive volcanic eruptions and their impacts. And by impact, I'm thinking about uh, in terms of landscapes and communities and so on. And I'm going to focus particularly on um, how we can improve our understanding of how of how volcanoes work and their impacts by looking at the um, retrospectively at the analysis of past events. So this is work that I've been carrying out uh, for many years. Um, and in the last few years, in particular, in collaboration with colleagues from the University of East Anglia and the University of the West Indies Seismic Research Centre. And quite a lot of this work began under a UK NERC and ESRC funded project, Striva. And of course, Comet has also been providing um, uh, funding for this sort of work. So essentially, my starting point is that um, historical eruptions uh, have left, left a series of diverse records um, and reports. So these might be um, written observations, they might be um, visual records of eruption. And if we want to properly understand what's going to happen in the future, uh, then one of those, one of the sources of data that we can exploit are these records from past events. So here are some just some examples of some visual records, two examples of uh, volcanic eruptions of Vesuvius in Italy, one from uh, observation at the time in 1822, another from observation at the time in 1779, and then a photographic record of see this is a snapshot of the Pinatubo eruption of 1991. And just to kind of, just to kind of em emphasize this kind of starting point, is a visual image um, from uh, uh, Reuters, this is the uh, 2015 eruption of Calbuco volcano in Chile, um, which erupted essentially without warning. I think there were th about three hours worth of precursory seismicity, and then drove this enormous um, eruption. And we can see from the um, the, the from uh, Pliny's description of the Vesuvius AD 79 eruption, we can immediately see the similarities. In the early afternoon, an unusual cloud arose. From a nearby mountain, it looked like a pine tree, but it rose to a great height and then split off into branches. And so here we see the, the trunk of that pine tree and then the way that the, the material is spreading uh, across uh, out into the atmosphere. So we have written records extending back thousands of years uh, depicting the states of volcanoes in eruption. And that obviously extends our capacity to uh, capture what happens at volcanoes um, dramatically over the lengths of the instrumental and um, satellite records we might have of active volcanoes. This is a slightly complicated graph, but this, this graphic shows um, the 33 volcanoes that are known to have ex experienced at least one large explosive eruption, so with a volcanic explosivity index of four or larger since 1979. Um, and this, so this is between, between 1979 and 2020. And the key point uh, I want to make with this graph is that, so the satellite era has captured a, a, a stunning number of events, but the, the, the notable feature of many of these events is, for example, the large eruptions which are represented in these black dots. These are eruptions at, vol at volcanoes that have been dormant for at least a century. The brown dots represent large eruptions at volcanoes that have been dormant for, for between a decade and a hundred years. So during the satellite era, most of the large explosive eruptions that we've observed have happened at volcanoes, which have either had um, rather threadbare or absent instrumental record of prior eruptions. So if we want to understand what might be happening, happening during an emerging crisis 
at a volcano, we then need to look into the historical and the geological records in order to start to improve our kind of mental models for what might happen next. So I suppose it's a very obvious uh, observation. Very, uh, most volcanoes spend, spend most of their time not erupting. So eruption durations are typically very short, um, typically days to months to a few years. Whereas the um, quiescent periods, so the intervals between eruptions can be very long. So the, um, the record of, um, for the, for if you look at the record of Holocene volcanoes, the, the median interval between successive eruptions at Holocene volcanoes, which have erupted multiple times, is around a decade. But this is dominated, of course, by the fact that some volcanoes are repetitively active. And in fact, the Holocene record of all volcanoes that have had at least one eruption um, gives us a, a quiescent interval, so an interval since the last eruption, which is actually more like 100 years. So unless our timescales of, of observations can extend over centuries, then we're unlikely to be able to gather the information we actually need in order to understand what might happen during a future event. So of course, for the last 150 to 200 years, volcanologists have been developing ways of measuring volcanoes, uh, ways of detecting sound waves of volcanoes, ways of measuring volcanic gases and so on. And this is one of the, uh, this image on the left um, is an image of, it's a picture of Frank Perrett, who was a, um, an innovator and inventor who became obsessed with volcanoes in the early 1900s and then traveled around the world. And his key feature was he, he was the ultimate vol kind of sensory uh, volcanologist. He, got into the habit of building huts for monitoring volcanoes. And here he is at Solfatara in Italy, uh, fully immersed in the, um, in the fumes. And he's listening to the sound of the volcano, which he's capturing on this kind of um, inverted uh, megaphone. So volcanologists have been making measurements of volcanoes and then trying to fit that into some mental model of what the next eruption might look like. And in volcanology, I suppose, one of the guiding assumptions is that the next eruption might well be like the last eruption. And in many volcanic systems, it's possible to find, you know, to, to define some sort of conceptual idea of a cycle. So for example, here's Jim Lure's cartoon of an historical eruption cycle of Volcan Orima in Mexico, where over the course of 100 years or so, the volcano goes through a series of episodes, building up um, a central system, having repetitive eruptions from that central system, and then a reset with a very large explosive eruption. So we've got a number of conceptual models which help us to guide our understanding of what might happen next. But essentially, volcanologists rely on the fact that the more we understand about how the volcano has just behaved, has behaved in the past, the better we will do in terms of understanding what's going to happen next uh, in a forecasting sense. So this is a graphic perhaps representing you know, a, a notional geophysical event cycle. So we start in the middle, this is kind of, this is now. And the kind of, these kind of, dashes and curve might represent some sort of notional activity in our system. So these might be um, episodes of unrest or past uh, eruptions. And obviously our, the, our instrumental records might only stretch for years at a, at a volcano that's actually got instruments on it. Uh, our satellite records only stretch back to 1979. The geological records obviously give us a way of looking deep into the past, but they don't, they will only typically only capture the events that, that actually emit rock that can then be preserved in the record. And so the historical records, the records of 
observations of people who've experienced these past events gives us that it, it covers that critical time period from now back across centuries and it captures the time periods both when the volcanoes were not erupting as well as when they were erupting and then most importantly the historical records also tell us about um, successes and failures in terms of what the preconditions were um, around what happened during the eruption was the erupt did it, was there a disaster because of um, conditions around the volcano at that time and it gives us insights into the nature of rapid response emergency relief and longer term recovery and planning and planning so that's those these are the themes that we're going to pick up pick up on in this talk so i'm going to talk around um the, so the, the main theme i'm going to develop is, is looking at the um, historical eruptions of st vincent um a volcanic island in the eastern caribbean and this is the kind of the key work that we've been doing collaborative, collaboratively with the Seismic Research Center at the University of East Anglia um, over the last uh, few years. So the island of St. Vincent um, has a, a long record of, of um, explosive eruptions. The first eruption of historical times was in 1718. Um, but the first eruption that has whether a kind of um, good um, first-hand accounts of the eruption happened in 1812. So in late April 1812, an, an explosive eruption began and Hugh Perry Keane, who was a, a local lawyer and landowner, um, described in his diaries the events of, of the eruption. So it, it began on a Thursday and in the afternoon, the rousing of the mountain increased. Flames burst forth, the dreadful eruption began and he spent all, time, all night watching it, um, despite the fact that the showers of stones and earthquakes um, he felt threatened his immediate destruction. Um, several days later, the eruption was still continuing. So there had been, there'd been um, volcanic ash uh, falling around the island for several days. But the ash cleared a little bit on May the 3rd, he proceeded uh, up to Wallyboo and describes a strange and dismal sight with the river dried up and the land covered with cinders and sulphur. And the, the, uh, the diarist, Perry Keane, drew a sketch of the eruption, and this was then used by um, JMW Turner um, to, as in a painting. And this shows the, the Souffriere of St. Vincent, um, which is, um, in this case, it's viewed from the western side of the island um, at a location quite close to uh, Chateau Bel Air. So the representation here is obviously of one of these, the nighttime eruption, probably of the April the 30th or so. So the 1812 eruption isn't documented in great detail, but there's a snap snapshot from a diary. Uh, but it was a remarkable event or an event that was remarked upon because um, May the 1st, so just a few hours following the start of the eruption, um, Barbados was covered in, um, in in volcanic ash, and this volcanic ash is called the the May ash because it landed it fell on May the first. So there's a there's a an archive a physical archival record of this eruption. Now it's quite likely that actually none of the ash samples of of May 1812 that are in museums were actually collected contemporaneously. It's more likely that they were actually excavated subsequently. Uh, so an historian, Robert Schomburg, for example, discovered the Mayash in 1846 and um, uh, it shared samples with um, museums and um, natural historians around the world. After the May, after the 1812 eruption of St. Vincent, there aren't that many hints as to what the volcano was doing uh, subsequently. 1837, there's a painting of the summit of the volcano. And here we see a, uh, a summit crater, which is flooded, so filled with water. Um, and 
this is just one snapshot of what the volcano looked like. In 1902, we still had a summit crater which was filled with water. And there may have, may or may not have been some sort of volcano related disturbances in between. So in 1901, um, people near the, uh, the volcano um, started reporting um, rock falls and feeling earthquakes and, and noticing landslides. And some of this activity um, increased in early 1902. And then in, on May the 7th, 1902, there was a devastating um, explosive volcanic eruption. So this eruption caused significant damage in the um, northern third of the island of St. Vincent, uh, caused significant um, casualties. And as you can see from contemporary photographs, um, what, what was originally um, tropical forest um, or plantation land was completely buried under volcanic ash. So here we've got, on the left-hand side, we've got a, um, a gorge, which is now completely remodeled and buried tens of feet deep in volcanic debris. So the 1902 eruption of St. Vincent was very closely documented because at that stage, um, the island of St. Vincent was under British colonial rule. And the one thing that the, uh, the colonists were very good at was actually keeping um, official records. So in the um, parliamentary correspondence around the volcanic eruptions um, and in the notes that accompany that that you can find in the, uh, the, the National Archives in the United Kingdom, there are actually really uh, very detailed accounts of the, first of all, the exchange of telegrams reporting the start of the event, and then reports from people on the island responding to the eruption, and then official accounts or accounts, for example, from the agricultural superintendent describing the physical um, and social impact of the eruption. Uh, so some of, and some of this, um, some of this information was public Im immediately shared publicly. So the, uh, the newspapers in the UK, for example, contained uh, sort of you know, published the details of what was going on at the time. And so we, again, from these reports, we can reconstruct the physical consequences of the eruption. We can determine where the main ash was deposited, the directions of the pyroclastic flows and the lahars um, that were associated with volcanic eruption. And there was also, um, immediately following the eruption, there was a, uh, a scientific expedition. Um, in this case, the, so the, the British participants were John Flett from the Brit British Geological Survey and Tempest Anderson. And their report and their notes document the state of the volcano immediately after this eruption. So this is a John Flett sketch of the summit crater that had been excavated during this eruption. Uh, showing sort of <clears throat> smoking features within that crater. As with the 1812 eruption, and indeed with the previous explosive eruption in 1718, the explosive eruption on in the at the Soufri area in the northern part of St. Vincent um, produced a considerable amount of volcanic ash, which was dispersed, carried by the winds, and then deposited across Barbados. And uh, a few years ago with uh, Alex Poulidis and others, we were able to, to rep uh, sort of replicate the simulation of this ash fallout using a meteorological ash dispersion model. So this, so the, um, so the model um, WRF chem is run and then we can calibrate it against those contemporary observations. And the contemporary observations include um, descriptions of the thickness of the ash in various locations on St. Vincent, and then some remarkable records of the accumulation rate and the thickness of ash um, in different locations on Barbados. So you don't need too much, you don't need much historical data, but you can actually, you can extract quantitative information, which actually provides you with a way of testing new models against those old data. The 
historical records um, are also an extremely rich um, source of information about evacuation, relief, response, and recovery. Um, so the official records obviously are one-sided. They don't contain, they typically don't contain the oral accounts and the first-hand accounts of the people who are most badly affected by the eruption. But it does actually document, um, for example, in this in this case, the case of St. Vincent, the way that communities were displaced and then rehoused. So there's quite a lot of detail which we can extract in terms of what happened to people who were who survived but were left um, homeless because their communities had been destroyed, and around the immediate government government response in terms of um, building new um, settlements in other parts of the island. And on St Vincent, this of course was, I mean, the, the desire to rebuild um, new accommodation was actually already in train because the island's sugar economy was in collapse. Um, the absent landlords weren't paying any attention to the lack of productivity on the land. And so there was a rapid switch um, away from sugar production to uh, production of other economic crops as a consequence of the, of the eruption. Now on St. Vincent, the volcano was quiet from late 1903. And then in 1971, there were the first uh, reports of um, bubbling and boiling of the crater lake. And again, the accounts of what was happening and the report, the reports which, that, are, that are happening around 1971 can be found in the uh, Foreign and Colonial and Colonial Office records of the UK National Archives. And again, this gives us a very rich insight into um, this, you know, the links between observations and um, the scientific response and then the political responses too. So in 1971, we can create a timeline of the volcano. Um, it's quite likely that the crater lake level was already changing by late October, but there were clear observations, of, let's say, of boiling, bubbling by early November. And by the 20th of November, the first, uh, there was the first appearance of the dome of lava that started to extrude above the surface of the lava lake. Um, in the background to this, there was lots of correspondence around um, the emergency response. The US Geological Survey sent an in infrared instrument to make some observations. And on the basis of those observations, an evacuation was called and 11,000 people were displaced um, away from the volcano. But in the case of 19 1971 eruption, the, uh, the dome growth slowed. Um, the, the crater lake of water persisted. It got very hot, but it, it uh, remained in place. And there was no acceleration in terms of the state of the volcano. So eventually the, the, the eruption um, came to an end. Eight years later, in April 1979, there was a relatively rapid onset into an eruption. The Seismic Research Center had uh, the, the scientists of the Seismic Research Unit, as it was then in the University of the West Indies, had seen some changes in the seismicity in the volcano. And then overnight, uh, on April the 13th, um, a major explosive eruption sequence began. Um, and so this is a, just some photographs of some of the um, large explosive events in this sequence. Now, there was, quite, there was a quite a, again, it was quite a dramatic eruption in that the so the, the first um, serious um, warning of, of seismicity came on about the 11th of April. Um, the first explosive eruption began on the 13th of April. And then there was a period of about um, uh, 12 or 14, 13 days when there were repeated discrete explosive eruptions. And then in early May, the explosive activity ceased, the crater lake had now disappeared, it had been buried under volcanic ash, and the eruption switched to an effusive pattern of behavior. And then there were six months of slow effusion of dome 
the, of the lava dome within the crater. The, in terms of the um, immediate displacement of people, the impact on people, um, probably because of the awareness of the volcano and the timely warnings from the Seismic Research Center, uh, there was a spontaneous evacuation as the eruption began, 15,000 people evacuated, and there were no direct fatalities as a consequence of the eruption. One of the challenges, or one of the, um, or one of the interesting challenges in terms of the response to the eruption was that in the, in the UK, there was a change of government um, after the eruption. So in fact, there's a quite interesting story about how the political response to the, the UK political response to the event uh, changed as a consequence. So since 1979, the Soufri of St. Vincent had been completely quiet. Um, there was a um, seismic monitoring in place. And over the last few years in particular, the Seismic Research Centre team have invested a significant amount of effort in building uh, community awareness of the volcano and of the possibility that it might erupt again. And was a very strong volcano awareness campaign, which always culminated, which culminated in having kind of a volcano awareness week each year. The 19, uh, sorry, December 2020, um, the most recent eruption of the Sufria St. Vincent began essentially completely quietly um, as an observer. So again, there'd been a, a change in seismicity had been detected a little while before that, um, but a, a, a Vincentian uh, or an, a Vincentian expat on the island took a photograph of the summit crater just after Christmas. And you can see there's a little steaming dome of lava extruding within that summit crater lying right next to the 1979 lava dome. This dome then it continued to extrude at a rate of one or two cubic meters a second and gradually grew over the next three months. The um, so the, the change in the behavior of the volcanic system as they had, had been, I mean, so that the change had been anticipated, detected by the Seismic Research Center in um, November, 2020. Uh, the response to the, um, so the response to the dome forming eruption is very well documented in a paper by Joseph, Pat Joseph and others in Nature Communications recently. But it was an extraordinarily interesting uh, eruption to watch because it was very closely reported, very, um, it's, it's kind of a model of science communication in a crisis in a way. Um, but then after uh, about three months of um, slow and steady gro dome growth, it was a very rapid transition in early April 2021, and we moved into a, an explosive phase of eruption. So the onset of the explosive phase was the 9th of April, and the end of the explosive phase was the 22nd of April. So it, during the early stages of the eruption, the question was, here, here we have a, a diffusive eruption. Is it going to be like 1971, which stopped, or is it going to be like some other eruption? But of course, none of the other historical eruptions on St. Vincent had knowingly begun with an effusive phase. And that's probably because if they had done, it wouldn't necessarily have been detected. Here we have the transition to the explosive phase. The explosive phase, as in 1979, um, was marked by a series of repetitive explosions, which lasted, which were discrete explosions, each of which lasted you know, tens of minutes, maybe hours. Um, but those discrete explosions were then spaced out over a couple of weeks. So this is an early, the, the first explosion um, detected on the on the 9th of April by the Seismic Research Center. For the first three to four days of the explosive phase of eruption, which are really, again, really nicely documented in um, the paper by Joseph and others, there was an intense phase of um, pulsing eruptions with deposition of ash around the island. And this is immediately um, reminiscent of the five days or so in um, May 1812, 
when the kind of the, the, the diarist is reporting the, the same sorts of features with kind of everything covered in ash, um, the atmosphere you know, opaque, hard to see through, and, and so on. And so here, here's, for example, this is a satellite image, the, um, which is used for detection of ash, these particular wavelengths. And so you can see pulses of explosions releasing discrete plumes of ash, which are then carried away from the volcano. And this activity then um, repeated over a number of days. So our understanding or our observation of the 2021 eruption of St. Vincent um, has both enriched our understanding of the historical events, which we had partial records, but no, you know, but not necessarily any overarching picture. And at the same time, those, those historical records also helped to enrich our understanding and interpretation of the events that were happening during this most recent eruption. So just to um, move on to a, a, a second and a brief example, I thought it was worth mentioning something about the, the Tonga eruptions of um, 2022. So in January 2022, there was an extraordinary sequence of events at what's called Hunga Tonga, Hunga Hayapi, which is a volcanic island set in the South Pacific uh, and a, a volcanic system which has been closely watched over the last 15 to 20 years and has had a sequence of explosive eruptions over that time. And here's an image from a uh, satellite image from early on in the volcanic eruption. And essentially, with relatively little precursory activity that was detected, uh, the volcanic eruption generated an enormous ash plume. Um, and with the marvels of uh, satellite detections uh, and sort of, you know, uh, social media um, information about this was, a, was very quickly available, um, uh, very quickly available. So there's already a considerable amount of um, papers published on this event. So here we've got um, a stereo analysis of these um, weather satellite and optical images of the, uh, of the plume. And this analysis shows that, that parts of the plume in the early phase of the eruption um, reached an altitude of between 50 and 55 kilometers. So this is, the, this is an extraordinary energetic eruption um, producing the, the highest detected plume in the satellite era. And again, we've got um, the analysis also shows how the, how the plume then spread um, uh, locally and then regionally. So immediately the question was, well, how big is this eruption? It's got this enormous plume, it's enormously energetic. And again, the historical or what one historic possible historical analog is actually the eruption of Krakatoa in 1883. Now, the, crack, the Krakatoa eruption of 1883 say, was a tremendously large event. And it was the first event for which there's very closely documented um, scientific reports. So the, there was a, at this stage, there was a global telegraph network. So information about the event was shared rapidly. Um, in the UK, a, um, a meteorologist called George Simons um, uh, took charge and chaired a Krakatoa committee. Now, George Simons was already um, what you might these days might call a citizen scientist. So he'd, as a meteorologist, he wanted to know, he wanted to understand the patterns of rainfall across the UK. So he'd um, got a series of citizen volunteers to start measuring rainfall uh, in their back gardens, essentially, over the previous few decades. And so this kind of crowdsourcing of data was something that was very familiar to him. So Simon's put notices in newspapers, in magazines, and sent out letters requesting information and asked people all around the world to send in their observations. And so we've got a very rich record, an extraordinary rich record in the Krakatoa report of the Royal Society of not only the physical consequences of the eruption, but also 
the sights and sounds that accompanied that eruption. Now, one of the really striking features of the eruption was that there, was, there were global detections, both of air waves um, and of um, sea waves triggered by the eruption. And here's a, here's a paper by uh, Lieutenant General Strachey, Chairman of the Meteorological Council, in the Krakatoa report, where he um, looked at the barograms, so the pressure records in different stations around the world, um, and detected the first arrival of the, of the sound waves carried in the atmosphere as a consequence of the eruption, and detected, determined that they were traveling at the, the speed of sound. Um, and here's an, a, a really nice um, paper by um, Matoza and others in response to the Hunga Tonga Hunga Haipi eruption. And in this, um, in their bar chart A, this shows the arrival times, sort of um, as a function of distance, of the um, of the first um, pressure wave following the Hunga eruption, which were in black, and then he's overlaid on that the data from the Krakatoa eruption. So, it, extraordinarily simple and extraordinarily effective. Both of the both the Hunga Tonga eruption and the Krakatoa eruption um, ex triggered the excitation of an atmospheric wave which traveled around the world. Uh, and it was this, obviously the same process in the same co in, in, in both cases. So in this case, it's called um, it's a LAM wave. And in both the case of the um, Hunga Tonga and Krakatoa eruption, this atmospheric pressure wave traveled around the globe multiple times. So we've got detections over at least four passes, extending over about six days. And as Matoza and others say, well, an explosion of this size has never previously, you know, this is the largest explosion in the modern geophysical record. And as measured by the land wave amplitude, the explosion was comparable in size to the Krakatoa eruption. Now the challenge or the interesting questions around uh, Krakatoa eruption, of course, is that at the moment, the volcanologists' ideas of the size or scale of eruption are pretty much predicated on how much rock was thrown out. So that's the volcanic explosivity index, or perhaps how much sulfur dioxide was emitted, which you could then quantify by the looking at the kind of impact on the climate system. And Krakatoa was very well known for both of those. So this is a precursor explosion in uh, May 1883, prior to the main collapse of the Krakatoa system, but in Krakatoa, the island that was there disappeared. We can quantify the amount of rock that's erupted. And then following the Krakatoa eruption, there were tremendous visual impacts in terms of the, the, the aerosol emitted by the, by the eruption persisted in the stratosphere for several years. And we had um, many months of really vivid afterglow and sunsets recorded again from all around the world. In the case of the Hunga Tonga eruption, this is an eruption which is which was out of a volcanic system which was predominantly underwater. Um, so the the way how do we quantify the size of that eruption if we can't detect where the volcanic products um, have ended up? And so it's it's it it it's an poses an interesting challenge in terms of thinking about um, how can you you know how do you quantify the size scale of these sorts of events? Um, so the final point I suppose is that as in the case of the St Vincent eruption, there's the um, the Hunga Tonga eruption was a tremendously um, I mean it's a really a dramatic um, event. We've observed things that have never been previously been observed during the in geophysical, modern geophysical instrumental era or the satellite era. Yet in the historical records, we can still find close analogues. So in a way, uh, you know, in terms of volcano behavior, um, there's nothing new under the sun. We, are lear we can learn from the past as much as we can learn from, from, from looking at the contemporary events.
So I'll just close off and say, well, of course, um, historical records offer us rich sources of data, which have the potential to extend well beyond the limits of the satellite or modern instrumental eras. The next steps in analysis in decades to come will be to build these sorts of data into, for example, machine learning approaches. So help us to detect change at restless volcanoes before uh, the onset of an eruption. And I suppose for me, actually, the, the thing I've learned most about actually is that the retrospective analysis for historical events opens up new pathways for engagement and sharing and narratives. And it's a really important tool for empowering communities for living around volcanoes and ultimately for strengthening resilience of volcanic areas. And this is, I suppose, the validation of what we've been doing with our colleagues and the validation of why we'll, we might continue to do that in the future. So I'll just leave with a, an image. Um, the final thing I should say actually is that uh, this work takes time. Uh, so th this is the, this is kind of, you know, an, a step along a, a pathway which we've been working on for more than 15 years. And I owe a huge amount to many colleagues, collaborators, archivists, librarians, and funding agencies in order in terms of sustaining this work. Thank you very much. Thank you, David, for that great insight. Uh, I always find it fascinating how much information you can extract from these historical records. Um, if you have any questions, please pose them in the chat or the question and answer function, uh, and we can work through those. Um, while we wait, I'd like to start with one, and it kind of relates to your last point, Toad. So I imagine it's, you know, it's a very time intensive process to collate all this data in a variety of different formats and sort of piece together a meaningful picture. Um, so do you have a sense of like how many volcanoes and you know have these useful records that are still to be explored? Um, and just how intensive a research process of is this to conduct a, such a forensic analysis on, you know, maybe just a handful of volcanoes? Uh, so, so in terms of how many, I, I think there's, I think there's going to be, um, there's, a, there's, there's a wealth of data out there um, waiting to be explored and exploited. And one of the, I mean, it's an opportunity in a, in a way in terms of one of the legacies of colonialism is that um, is that the, is that there are records of you know by kept by the colonizers which are accessible so there are, there are Spanish archives going back to the 1600s there are Dutch archives and then there are, of course there are British UK British archives but of course locally you know every volcano will have there will be records in every community around a volcano records of some sort and they might not have been written down they might be oral um, or they might just be a glimpse of something that happened in the past so i think it's 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 a really rich area to work in and i think that the thing is i suppose i, I mean the thing that, that really struck me starting this work on st vincent is that when you have a you know when you share with communities what you found in your records, it actually opens up people to, to tell you their own stories of, you know, what their families, their forebears had done in the previous eruption or the eruption before that. So it's actually quite a, it's, it, it um, takes away the power imbalance that you often have when you have scientists turning up somewhere to say, I'm a, you know, I'm a scientist, I'm going to tell you what's happening. In fact, it's not that it doesn't work that way at all. It actually, it makes it much easier for people to share information and then start to make connections. And then, as I say, it, it's a way of empowering communities to realize that they, you know, that they have some intrinsic understanding of, of what's happened in the past and what might happen in the future. Okay, I can't see any questions in the chat just yet. Um, yeah, please pose your questions in the chat if you have any questions for David. Um, Maybe I can ask another question. Yes. 
Okay. Which is about uh, those data that we can gather from uh, different historical uh, data sets or uh, community reports or diaries. Uh, what kind of uncertainties are we dealing with here? Or do they uh, matter in terms of deriving a scientific conclusion from that? Yeah, so that's, that's in, in, I think that's a really interesting question. So, so I think, I suppose that the, um, I mean, so, if we look at somewhere like um, Vesuvius, for example, which is a, a volcano in Italy, city of Naples, um, it started erupting again in 1631, and then it erupted until 1944, and then went quiet. So um, because of its location, close to, close to people and so on, because of the timescales over which it's erupted with the um, the Enlightenment, um, it was in a location that lots of people like to come and visit. Actually, early observers started to use it as kind of a, as a model system to make their own, to start making measurements. So people were measuring the size of the volcano before the 1700s. By the late 1700s, people were making you know, really careful observations from day to day in terms of the, what was changing. Um, people were starting to you know, measure the temperature of the system using early thermometers, and then they were measuring the height of the system using early barometers. So in a, so in a way, you've got the evolu you know, the beginning of instrumental records. So by the, the mid-1800s, people are actually making quantitative observations routinely and recording those observations. And we can always replicate those measurements because we can either recreate their instruments or we can go back and make those same sorts of measurements again. Um, the areas in, which are harder to interpret in terms of thinking about uncertainties and so on are kind of what people are writing. So, so if somebody's written, you know, somebody writes a description of an eruption, who's their audience? So if they're writing in a letter, to somebody, they, you know, maybe they'll they'll give a narrative that actually just re represents their experience of it. If they're writing um, an account that's to be published, maybe there are some unwritten rules about what it has to include. So in, again, thinking about looking at Vesuvius, most of the published accounts of the 1631 eruption were, fr were framed within within the notion that. Uh, the, the, there was an ultimate hand behind it, the hand of God. So it was a kind of a Christian narrative because, of course, you weren't allowed to, you know, you, you wouldn't describe it in any other terms. But then by the time you come to the mid-1700s, people are now happy to describe what they see or they think they see in a way that's no longer just being deferential to the way that Pliny had described an eruption and that everyone subsequently, you know, so this idea that so, so there's some, you know, canonical, you know, expectation of what you see during an eruption and so on. So, the, so uncertainty is actually a really interesting question. And I suppose what you'd, um, you know, if you if you are doing an investigation along those lines, you'd want to look for multiple sources, and then find where those sources intersect. So it's you know, using the scientific method, but with with data that you might not think of the scientific data to start with. Um, but the, I think in terms of understanding the response of, you know, how, how can you, communities respond or what happens subsequent to an eruption and what happens in the lead up to an eruption, I think there's quite a lot of open space in terms of, um, things to look for because most volcanologists i mean prior to the satellite era i mean now we're in the satellite era we're in the era of global monitoring in a way so we can keep an eye on we can watch things when things are not happening but actually you know a lot of volcanology has been about volcanologists responding to events and so we we understand a lot about the events but we don't necessarily understand much about the lead up to those events 
or what happened afterwards. That sounds pretty interesting because, uh, especially when you're talking about what happens afterwards, uh, because I know very little, nothing about the volcano eruption. <laughs> so I just said, like, there are a period of uh, like uh, repeated eruptions followed by a growth of the dome and then somehow it finishes. So does it always finish like that? No, so again, that's the, um, so, so, so St. Vincent, St. Vincent we, we know pretty well, certainly from, from the 1902 eruption and on, we've got quite a good, um, you know, we can be quite confident that we know roughly how the volcanoes behaved. But um, no, in terms of conceptual models of volcanoes, there's really not very much understanding of what it is that defines the end of an eruption and, and what happens during that transition from erupting to not erupting. So obviously that presumably the supply of magma ceases and the system slowly kind of freezes up, um, but it's not well defined. And one of the, I think one of the interesting things that will come out of the ongoing work around the 2021 eruption of St. Vincent is that we've now got an eruption that started with the lava dome and then transitioned to an explosion. And we can compare that with the 1979 eruption, which was the other way around. So with explosion that then transitioned to an effusive eruption. And it, um, again, thinking about sort of um, archive data, it's not so, not completely surprising, but it, um, but there's almost no physical material preserved from either the 1979 lava dome, which was in the middle of a crater lake. Um, there's there's a couple of samples in um, museum collections, and similarly the lava dome from 1979, the crater was really not very accessible. Uh, so uh, there were a few collections of the lava dome made at, at the time, um, which are still accessible. But in fact, there's really not very much material left now that materials have all been excavated during a subsequent eruption. So, they, um, so I know that within, you know, within comets, people are thinking about um, issues around open data, but also preserving and archiving data and making sure it's accessible to future generations. And on the geological side, I don't think we've paid enough attention to the fact that the, that the physical samples, uh, the physical materials are also important. Um, and, you know, they might have been collected in somebody's thesis collection 30 years ago. Um, but nonetheless, they're important. And, and I think that um, we need to have a you know, discussion as a community around how we actually make sure that those materials are um, preserved in a way or you know, re retained in a way that, that, that they can be uh, reused later. Right. Yeah, I can imagine that must be, must be very different, like in terms of archiving data and archiving samples. It takes yes. a long time to do that. <laughs> Yeah, I think it's really interesting to think about the legacy that you know we're leaving behind for the future generations, um, and also you know, not just I guess the physical samples, but also the change to the digital era and the fact that yeah. things are recorded over social media now rather than often written down. In the book. Yes. Yeah. Great. Um, okay, so we do have one question now. Um, so from an anonymous attendee. So what is more important, the time gap between two successive eruptions or its period of dormancy to predict the next eruption? So that's that's a really interesting question. So I think that the um, yeah. So there's not a, there's not an easy answer to that. So I th so I think so our the observation is you know from the, the if you look at all of the large explosive eruptions of the satellite era, so we've had more than 40 explosions at about 33 volcanoes, probably 35 or 36 now. Um, most of those have happened at volcanoes where, where there's been no 
instrumental record of a previous eruption. So geologically, we'll, it, in all cases, would find examples of a previous eruption, uh, but that event might not have been well dated. So in, intrinsically, that means that um, it's difficult to be, you know, it's hard to pick the volcano you're going to study intensively um, before it's showing unrest because you're not, you're, you know, you, you'll pick as an example for, for study, but you, but you don't know that whether the learning you're going to get on that system is going to feed into anything uh, in terms of impending activity um, on any, real, on any uh, realistic time scale. But there are some volcanoes which are repetitively active, and those are attractive to study as scientific objects, because if you know they're repetitively active, you can design your experiments and you can develop your hypotheses and test them, and then you can retest them and so on. Um, and, and often those repetitive, you know, in, in those examples where you have repetitively active volcanoes, uh, you might well have, have quite an interesting social uh, and physical ecosystem around it in terms of communities living near those volcanoes, um, aware of the volcano behavior and sort of able to uh, cope well with it. So one example would be Sakurajima in Japan, for example. Um, but I think what we don't yet know is you know, to what extent can we, so we might be able to build a forecast model on, on a volcano that shows repetitive behavior, but what we don't know is to what extent is that model then, can we then take that model and apply it to another system? Um, and there's, you know, there's quite a lot of interesting models around in terms of think, think about the changes that happen in the lead up to an eruption. So you have to, you have to uh, typically you have to break rock. You, you know, the magma has to move through the crust. You then have to break an opening to the surface and then eruption be can begin. Well, I suppose it's a sign of how little data we have on those precursory systems, that this is a problem that's not yet solved. That it's, um, I'm not, I'm sure someone will jump in if they know one, but I don't think there have been many successful forecasts or, um, of an eruption start time, for example, on the basis of um, precursory activity of a volcano that's not previously erupted. So often, often we can retrofit models to the, to the data after the event, but we're still at a really early stage in terms of uh, or we're at a stage of re really relying on kind of expert intuition as much as on um, quantitative you know, analysis when, when it comes to anticipating what's going to happen next. So I think the machine learning era is going to be, as we move into this, the machine learning era, that's going to be really interesting to see how that develops because at volcanoes where we might now have 30 or 40 years of satellite observations where you might have multiple decades of instrumental data if there have been multiple eruptions at those volcanoes then in principle those are the sorts of systems we can we could train on machine learning models most effectively you'd think and then the, that that gives us a good starting point in terms of whether those models actually work for the next event great Thanks again, David. Um, okay. Yeah, thank you for everyone attending. Um, we don't have a confirmed schedule for any upcoming webinars yet, but we'll communicate those um, to you via email as usual. Uh, we're on the hour now, so we'll close the webinar. So yeah, thanks again to David. Okay. Thank you to everyone Great. attending, and we'll see you all next month.